And hello everyone. My name is Kara Burke, a pharmacist in the Division of Drug Information. We hope you and your families are staying safe during these challenging times. I would like to welcome you to this educational activity sponsored by the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, Office of Communications, Division of Drug Information. We thank you and appreciate your patience as we continue to offer these CE courses completely virtual. Today's webinar is titled FDA Drug Topics, FDA Drug Information Resources and Applicability to Healthcare Professionals. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few housekeeping remarks. All faculty are expected to use generic names. If trade names are used, those of several companies should be used rather than only that of a single supporting company. Unapproved use disclosure. CE faculty and speakers are required to disclose to the attendees when products or procedures being discussed are off-label, unlabeled, not FDA approved, and any limitations on the information that is presented. The faculty's planning committee members and the FDA CE consultation and accreditation team have nothing to disclose. All inquiries for information relating to our webinars should be directed to our email address ddiwebinars at fda.hhs.gov. We hope you will enjoy meeting our presenter today. Commander Lindsay Wagner received her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Following graduation, she completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship in drug information with Purdue University, Janssen Scientific Affairs, and FDA. Commander Wagner joined the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps in 2012. Her duty station is at the FDA's Division of Drug Information in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. In her role as a branch chief, she leads pharmacists and other experts in providing timely, complete, and accurate responses to drug information inquiries from around the globe. Commander Wagner contributes her expertise to many programs, including expanded access and President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Commander Wagner serves as the Director of the Regulatory Pharmaceutical Fellowship Program, which offers jointly sponsored post farm d training opportunities in the areas of drug information, medication safety, regulatory policy, and drug advertising and promotion in partnership with academia and pharmaceutical industry. Commander Wagner enjoys providing presentations on drug-related topics and has contributed to several book chapters about drug information and FDA's regulatory authority. Now, please give a warm online welcome to Commander Wagner. All right, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as introduced, my name is Lindsay Wagner, and it is my pleasure today to provide an overview of FDA's drug information resources. I'll be focused today on how healthcare professionals can best use FDA's online drug information resources in their practice, as well as how to stay up to date on new information with ease. Please note that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are my own and should not be construed to represent FDA's view or policies. The objectives of today's presentation are to, one, identify drug information resources for healthcare professionals to stay informed on FDA actions, decisions, and initiatives. Two, demonstrate the use and application of these resources for common health-related inquiries. And three, discuss non-traditional drug information resources, such as social media, podcasts, and videos. Within FDA, there are nine center-level organizations. The Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, also known as CEDAR, is responsible for protecting and promoting public health by helping to ensure that human drugs are safe and effective for their intended use, that they meet established quality standards, and that they are available to patients. The Division of Drug Information, or DDI, where I work, is located within CEDAR, the mission of DDI is to optimize CEDAR's educational and communication efforts to our global community. DDI serves as CEDAR's focal point for public inquiries regarding human drug products and supports FDA's mission to promote and protect public health. 
DDI receives and responds to inquiries through multiple channels, including phone, email, Facebook, and letters. In 2021, DDI received over 40,000 inquiries. The top 10 list of audience type here shows that healthcare professionals, including physicians, pharmacists, and nurses, are a large part of our audience. We answer many types of inquiries for our callers as outlined in our top 10 inquiry topics list, including questions regarding COVID-19 therapeutics, REMS programs, opioids, drug safety, and regulatory inquiries from industry. DDI uses all the resources I will discuss in today's webinar to help answer these inquiries. Today, we'll focus on the resources used most frequently to answer these questions from healthcare professionals. To begin, we're gonna focus on objective number one, identifying drug information resources for healthcare professionals to stay informed on FDA actions, decisions, and initiatives. This is a list of FDA's drug information databases and resources that will be discussed today in further detail. I wish we had time today to cover every resource and database that we use in the Division of Drug Information to respond to the thousands of inquiries we receive, but in the interest of time, this list focuses on a subset of FDA's drug information databases and resources that healthcare professionals can use to find information on drug approvals, drug labeling and information, therapeutic equivalency, biosimilars, patent and exclusivity information, drug shortages, and safety. To find valuable drug information resources through our website, visit www.fda.gov and select the menu button located next to the search option in the top right corner. From the expanded menu options, select Drugs under Products. Once on the Drugs page, you can navigate to the resources in one of two ways. Under the Navigate the Drugs section, you can select the topic options to find resources specific to the topic of interest to you, such as drug information, safety and availability, drug approvals, drug development, and more. The second option is to select Resources for You under Priority Areas and Initiatives. We'll use this option to continue since it is more general. Once you select the Resources for You option, select Information for Healthcare Professionals. You can see some of the many useful topics delivered to you on this page. Now that you know where to locate the resources we'll be reviewing today, I'm going to demonstrate the use and application of these resources. I'm going to do this by using real example drug information inquiries that we have responded to in DDI to demonstrate how we have used FDA's resources to answer common questions and how you can use these same public resources to answer these questions as well. All the examples have been selected at random and do not serve any purpose other than to illustrate the use of an FDA database or resource. So let's dive right in. Some of our most popular databases are used to find drug labeling and information. These include the NDC directory and drugs at FDA. We'll also provide drug labeling and information through FDA's online label repository, which I'll refer to as labels.fda.gov. And we'll talk about FDA's PEPFAR database or the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Here we have two healthcare professionals asking common questions that can be answered with these resources. The first question asks, I need to know if an NDC number is correct. My patient's insurance rejected a claim because of the NDC number. And the second question asks, I went to refill a desiccated thyroid extract and the insurance won't pay because it isn't approved by FDA. Is this true? What changed? So we'll walk through these two inquiries and how to find the answers. For the first question involving a national drug code number and insurance rejection, we'll visit the NDC directory to find the answer. The NDC directory publishes NDC numbers and the information submitted as part of the listing information. This information is updated daily. You can search the NDC directory by proprietary name, non-proprietary name, NDC number, labeler, or application number. And if you need an answer on the go, FDA offers an NDC Express app. 
On the left, we show the information that we might collect from the healthcare professional about the product in question to help us search the NDC directory for an answer. The URL for the NDC directory is shown on the bottom right if you want to practice online as we go, and you'll continue seeing those URLs throughout this presentation. From the information collected, we will use the non-proprietary name as a search term to illustrate how to perform this search. As a reminder, all examples in this presentation are chosen at random and they have no other intended meaning. So here we show a screenshot from the NDC directory search results. There is an additional text search feature at the top right corner that allows you to enter multiple additional search terms, which can be separated by quotation marks. You can also click on the section headers to sort them in ascending or descending order. We show again the NDC number at the top that was rejected. It's up at the blue box. In the results below that, we can see the NDC that most closely matches does not have an additional zero at the beginning of the code. So we have an answer to our question. But why does this discrepancy exist? These numbers are slightly different because each drug product listed with FDA has a unique 10-digit three-segment number in the NDC directory. However, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, with which I'm sure you are all familiar, has a standard of an 11-digit NDC. Therefore, many NDC numbers will include an extra leading zero to achieve 11 digits, such as we see here in the first segment of the number. This leading zero may also be found in the second products code segment or the third package size segment. And since a zero can be a valid digit in an NDC number, this can lead to confusion when you're trying to reconstitute the NDC back to its FDA standard. So searching the NDC directory by these other identifiers in the way shown here today can be especially helpful. Next, we have the question about a product's approval status. We'll first try answering this question using Drugs at FDA. Drugs at FDA is a resource that includes all FDA-approved medications. The main uses of Drugs at FDA are to find approved labeling for approved human drug products, to find generic drug products that are therapeutically equivalent to an innovator drug product, and to view the historical documents associated with a particular drug application, such as the past approved labeling, approval letters, and review packages. Since drugs at FDA includes only approved drugs, if the drug product we search for is not included in this database, it tells us that the product may be unapproved. For the purposes of an example search, we will type in a specific desiccated thyroid extract marketed as Armour Thyroid. Now you can also browse alphabetically by drug name or run a report for drug approvals by month. This function can be helpful when a patient asks about a drug they heard that was recently approved by FDA, but they're not able to remember the name. And Drugs at FDA is perhaps our most well-known database, and it is also available as an app. So returning to the question, on the left, we show the search results for Armour Thyroid. It does not bring up any results, so we suspect the product is unapproved but we still want to find out for sure and see if anything changed in order to answer the question. Now on the right, I've included the listing for the levothyroxine, and that's to demonstrate the utility of drugs at FDA when you're searching for an approved drug product and receiving results. In the red box, the original approval information is highlighted to point out that this type of information is publicly available for you. And in drugs at FDA, you can find historical documents for many drug applications including approval letters, clinical review documents, and older versions of the drug's labeling. Other information on this page includes the different strengths available, dosage forms, and the marketing status, all of which can be helpful in answering questions you encounter as a healthcare professional. So earlier I mentioned a database available from FDA called FDA's Online Label Repository, located at the web address labels.fda.gov. This online resource from FDA provides information for prescription, over-the-counter, and unapproved drugs, including the labeling as submitted by the company. Since we suspect that this product may be unapproved, we'll try looking here in labels.fda.gov. We'll search again by the proprietary name using the example of Armour Thyroid, 
But there are multiple ways to search that are shown here, including by active ingredient, NDC number, and application number, as well as some combinations of those options that can really help you zero in quickly on the labeling for a particular company or product. So the labeling for Armour Thyroid does appear in this database, and the rightmost column identifies the marketing category. You can see this database confirms the company listed this product with the marketing category of unapproved drug other. We can confirm this by clicking on the proprietary name hyperlink to access the drug labeling. At the top, there is a disclaimer message that states that this drug has not been approved by FDA and it provides a link to more information about unapproved drugs. So the second part of this question was, what changed? Since this drug does not appear in drugs at FDA with any kind of regulatory history showing a marketing status change, such as you'll see when a drug has been previously approved and then discontinued, we can reasonably conclude that this denial from the insurance company is not due to a regulatory status change, but is more likely due to a change in the insurance company policy in covering the product, even though they previously covered it with this marketing category. The last database I mentioned earlier that we want to review today is relatively new. It was launched by the Division of Drug Information in January of 2020. The President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR program, is supported by multiple government agencies and has provided antiretroviral treatment for nearly 19 million people. Prior to the launch of this PEPFAR database, labeling from FDA was unavailable for most of the antiretroviral drug products provided through the PEPFAR program because of their tentative approval status and their inability to be marketed in the United States. This database provides information about application status, populations for use, proper storage conditions, current manufacturing information, and more. Users of this database can also generate reports and download the FDA reviewed or approved drug labeling. So next we'll talk about the two most popular online books provided by FDA. Here we have a provider asking a common question regarding generic substitution. She asks, my patient is requesting a generic version of their inhaler. Are there any therapeutically equivalent generics approved? We'll walk through how to answer this question using the electronic orange book. The orange book provides a list of all prescription drug products that are approved by FDA for safety and effectiveness, along with therapeutic equivalence determinations for multi-source prescription products. The Orange Book is also updated daily to include product information for new generic drug approvals, which is important for substitution purposes. There are many ways to search the Orange Book, including by proprietary name, active ingredient, application number, company name, dosage form, and route of administration. If you know the patent number, you can use that to directly access patent information. For the purposes of providing an example, We'll search albuterol sulfate to see what information we can find for this healthcare professional. And additionally, just like some of our other popular databases, there is an Orange Book Express app if you prefer to access this resource via an app. Here we see the search results for albuterol sulfate. Within these results, we can narrow our findings using the search box in the upper right hand corner to only include metered aerosols. Similar to the NDC directory, the section headers can be sorted in ascending or descending order. However, the Orange Book is different than the NDC directory or drugs at FDA in that the Orange Book provides information on patents and exclusivities for approved drug products. You may be asked in practice when a generic will become available, and this is a helpful resource to determine if a product has any approved therapeutically equivalent generics already or has any unexpired patents or exclusivities that may be protecting the innovator product from generic competition. And it may be difficult to see in this view, but the column headings for TE code RLD and RS are each hyperlinked. These hyperlinks go to the online Orange Book preface, which provides definitions for these terms and the information provided under each. When the TE code column is blank, 
we can quickly conclude that there are no approved therapeutically equivalent generic products. Here we can see that Prevental HFA has a therapeutic equivalence code of AB1, meaning that all approved generics that are rated as therapeutically equivalent to Prevental HFA will also show a rating of AB1 in their TE code column. So for this healthcare professional, the orange book quickly provides the information she needs. Many search results will just show AB to indicate therapeutic equivalence. Three character codes like this generally are assigned only in situations when more than one reference listed drug of the same strength has been designated under the same heading, such as what we're seeing here. We can also see other brands of albuterol that have their own generic equivalents as well. Pro-Air HFA, for example, shows the AB2 rating, meaning that all other generic products with AB2 shown are deemed therapeutically equivalent. A BX rating, which you see here, indicates that there are generic products approved with the same active ingredient, dosage form, route of administration, and strength, but they are not therapeutically equivalent. And more information, again, about AB, BX, and other ratings found in the Orange Book is available in the Orange Book preface that we discussed earlier, and you can easily access that by clicking on the TE code column heading hyperlink. I'm sure you've all heard by now of the Purple Book. The Purple Book is a database that contains information about all FDA licensed biological products regulated by CDER, including interchangeable products and their reference products. The Purple Book also contains information on all FDA licensed allergenic, cellular and gene therapy, hematologic and vaccine products regulated by the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, or CBER. Healthcare professionals may find the Purple Book Simple Search especially useful to see all associated products for a biological product, including biosimilars and interchangeable products. The Advanced Search is also useful for searching additional terms, including strength, dosage form, and product presentation. Um, for example, you can search for the term auto-injector using the advanced search option. When a biologic is searched, biosimilar and interchangeable biological products that are licensed will be listed under the reference product to which biosimilarity or interchangeability was demonstrated, so it is clear which can be substituted for one another. You can see the example search for adalimumab here on the left and a sampling of the search results on the right. To learn more about biosimilars, I highly recommend the recent webinar from January 25th of this year, and it's available for home study CE credit. It was titled FDA Drug Topics, Biosimilar and Interchangeable Biosimilars, Review of Scientific Concepts, Case Studies, and Resources. This webinar provided an intermediate overview of the scientific and regulatory basis for the biosimilar and interchangeable biosimilar approval pathway. To enhance understanding, case studies were reviewed that highlighted the data that can support biosimilarity and interchangeability. And this webinar demonstrated the functionality of the Purple Book database in depth, along with presenting case studies um, and that uh, overview of the biosimilar approval pathway. So if you want to learn more about biosimilars in the Purple Book, I encourage you to review this very helpful webinar. So now that we've covered drug information resources and online books, I will focus on a few more specialized databases such as the Drug Shortages Database and how to locate drug recall information using an example question from a concerned healthcare professional. He asks, I'm reading conflicting reports regarding epinephrine auto injectors. Is there a shortage or a recall? And we might add to this question or both, and we'll use our existing resources to answer this question. Our first stop is the FDA Drug Shortages Database. In the FDA Drug Shortages Database, you can search for current shortages or resolved shortages and discontinuations of products. You can also review drug shortage information by looking for a particular therapeutic category or for what is new or what is updated. Through this page, you can also report a drug shortage to FDA. Healthcare professionals are encouraged to inform FDA when they become aware of a shortage. Sometimes that is the first notification that the agency receives. 
the Cedar Drug Shortage Team then uses information from manufacturers, distributors, and market share data to determine if a shortage exists. We also offer the Drug Shortages app if you prefer to receive real-time updates directly to your device. And to answer our question, we'll look up epinephrine as an example. So looking up epinephrine in the FDA drug shortages database will take you to a results page listing all the different forms of epinephrine that are currently in shortage. Clicking on the auto injector formulation will take you to more details regarding this specific product, including when the drug shortage notice was first posted, the last date the information was updated, sponsor specific information, including company contact information, availability and estimated duration of the shortage, and the reason for the current shortage. There is one manufacturer here that still has an active drug shortage as seen on the right. Below that, we see that the most recently re-verified product information is from March of this year from a different manufacturer. So we'll also see what that result shows. Clicking through all of the information available, we can see that the Mylan auto injector is not currently in shortage and says it is readily available. The database also shows us that important safety information was sent through a Dear Healthcare Provider letter, which is hyperlinked and posted online. When we open this letter, we see that this was not a recall, but rather communicated important information regarding a potential device failure and how to inspect the device to reduce the chances of that failure. Clicking through the information in the drug shortages database like this, even for products that are currently available, can provide valuable information to the context and the history of a product shortage. Now let's check on this question from the perspective of a recall. To do this, we'll look up epinephrine in the drug recalls database. On the left is what the drug recalls homepage looks like. You can keyword search this database as well as filter by product type. Here we can see that a recall has been issued recently on March 22nd of this year. By clicking on the highlighted manufacturer link, we can learn more information about this recall. Clicking on that hyperlink brings you to the company's recall announcement. This information includes the date the recall was announced by the company, the product description, the reason for the recall, and company contact information. Depending on the level of the recall, this is also where you will find instructions and information about what to do if you have the affected product in stock. Another way to find drug recalls is through the enforcement reports. Once recalls are classified, all recalls go into FDA's enforcement reports according to the level of hazard involved. On the enforcement reports page, you can choose to view weekly enforcement reports or you can perform a search. I usually prefer the advanced search option because you can search by product description, recalling firm, the recall class, the reason for the recall, or an approximate date. So to answer this question, we understand why the healthcare professional thought they were reading conflicting reports. It seems like they were likely reading about different issues from different manufacturers, all involving epinephrine auto injectors. Our next set of resources assists you in staying up to date with FDA drug safety information, including how to report adverse events and other safety concerns to FDA. We'll again use two example questions from healthcare providers. The first is asking, my patient experienced an arrhythmia while taking a prescription drug. Could this be attributed to the medication? And the second, what safety information does the FDA have regarding compounded drug products? Starting with the first question, we would likely review the drug labeling using Drugs at FDA or another one of the drug information and drug labeling resources we covered earlier to check if arrhythmias are a known possible side effect with the patient's medications. In addition, we'll search for any drug safety communications about the drug and this concern. And as you can see here, a drug safety communication, also known as a DSC, was issued in March of last year regarding the risk of heart rhythm problems with use of lamotrigine in patients with heart disease. By clicking on the DSC, we can learn more about the data supporting this new warning. We also show on the left the DSC homepage. DSCs are CEDAR's primary tool for communicating important new and emerging safety information to the public. And shown in the top left red box, 
you may sign up to receive email alerts regarding new drug safety communications. If we wanted to see just the labeling change that was made in relation to this DSC, we can look at the Drug Safety Related Labeling Changes or SRLC database. You can search by the brand name or active ingredient or search by the labeling section that may have been changed. You can also check the patient counseling information slash patient information slash medication guide box to further your search to include these types of labeling updates. And from this page, you may also sign up to receive email alerts regarding labeling changes, and that's shown in the top left red box. To illustrate the SRLC database, we show here the Lamotrigine entry updated on April 2nd of 2021, at the same time the drug safety communication was released. Clicking on the drug name, we see that the approved labeling has been updated in the warnings and precautions section to inform prescribers about the risk of cardiac rhythm and conduction abnormalities. Switching to our second example question, which asks, what safety information does the FDA have regarding compounded drug products? FDA provides risk alerts for compounded human drug products. The Compounding Risk Alerts website is organized chronologically, with the most recent alerts listed first. The information provided on this website is intended to alert healthcare professionals of adverse event reports related to compounded human drugs. Following the link at the bottom of the screen takes you to FDA's Human Drug Compounding homepage. And from there, there's a menu on the left-hand side that lists the Compounding Risk Alerts website. Email updates are also offered for compounding risk alerts, so it is easy to stay informed with all of these safety alerts. Our inquirer earlier, who was asking about their patient who experienced an arrhythmia, you know, has, has shared with us a potential adverse event, and we'll want to have that reported to FDA's MedWatch Safety Information and Adverse Event Reporting Program. Healthcare professionals play a vital role by voluntarily reporting adverse reactions, product problems, and medication errors related to drug products. And you can also encourage your patients, family, and friends to report product problems directly as well. Reports submitted to MedWatch are reviewed by FDA's post-marketing safety staff, and the results of that review can lead to an FDA regulatory action such as changes to a drug's labeling or other action to improve the safety of the product. When that occurs, MedWatch safety alerts are issued to share that information with healthcare professionals, patients, and consumers. And there are many ways to stay informed, including email alerts, Twitter, and an RSS feed. Another FDA resource we've touched on already is the medication guide, and it can be part of a drug's approved labeling. We haven't talked yet about risk evaluation and mitigation strategy programs or REMS, so next we'll take some time to explain these two ways that serious safety concerns are communicated for approved drugs and the available resources for each. Here we have two healthcare professionals with questions about these resources. The first asks, where can I find the most up-to-date medication guide for a particular medication? And the second says, I'm dispensing a drug product and understand the REMS program was recently updated. How do I view the changes to see if there are new requirements? So let's review the resources for medication guides and REMS to find the answers. Starting with medication guides, FDA requires that a med guide be issued with certain prescribed drugs and biological products. So to find a particular med guide, you'll click search the medication guides database. For the purposes of providing an example, we've searched for cip ciprofloxacin. The database appears like this with information for drug name, active ingredient, formulation and route, application number, company, and date. You can conduct a keyword search in the right upper hand corner. Um, you can also download the database or scroll through the listings. And once you find the medication guide of interest to you, click on the hyperlinked drug name and download the drug's approved labeling. The medication guide will be found at the end of the document. Next, we'll answer the question about updating REMS requirements. REMS is a drug safety program that FDA can require for certain medications with serious safety concerns to help ensure the benefits of the medication outweigh its risks. 
REMS are designed to reinforce medication use behaviors and actions that support the safe use of that medication. And while all medications have labeling that informs healthcare stakeholders about medication risks, only a few medications require a REMS. So for the purposes of providing a recently updated example, we'll look at the isotretinoin iPledge shared system REMS program. So here you can see the isotretinoin iPledge shared system REMS result in the REMS at FDA database. REMS at FDA is a comprehensive database, and you can learn about the requirements of any particular REMS program. From this page, you can also sign up for REMS email alerts. You can download reports and data files about current REMS, as well as REMS that are no longer in place. Once you've clicked on a REMS of interest, there are several helpful tabs to select from. One of the most helpful tabs for healthcare providers will be the summary tab. This tab summarizes the requirements by type of participant, including healthcare provider, patient, pharmacy, and distributor. Each REMS listing on FDA's site also provides a link to the application holder's REMS website, which can provide further information and materials. Clicking on the Update History tab brings us to a chronological list of updates that have been enacted by the isotretinoin REMS program. And for this REMS, the FDA also has an informational website available with more information. So all of these resources help answer the healthcare professional's question and assist him with staying up to date. The FDA also provides access to therapeutics for emergency situations, such as we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic with emergency use authorizations, as well as with emergency requests for individual access to investigational treatments through FDA's expanded access program. Because of the similarity in the abbreviations and the overlap um, sometimes in emergency use, these programs can sometimes get confused with one another, but they are distinctly different. So here a healthcare professional is asking, I heard that some of the monoclonal antibodies authorized to treat COVID-19 have limited use currently. Where can I find additional information? So we'll use FDA's EUA website to answer this question, and then we'll also review resources about expanded access. So first, we'll navigate to the EUA website on FDA.gov. You can see the URL in the right-hand side, uh, but it's a bit long, so you can also perform a general internet search for FDA EUA, and it should be the first result from your search engine. On this EUA webpage, you will find helpful resources regarding the emergency authorization of not just drugs, but also vaccines and medical devices, and that includes diagnostic tests. If we click on the drugs and non-vaccine biological products link, we'll jump down to the section of the webpage that's dedicated to the authorization of therapeutics such as drugs. And on the right-hand side, we can see the original justification for the EUA program is described on this website. And there are links to relevant resources if you wanna learn more. So navigating through this section, we can see a search bar that can help you quickly narrow down to a particular product if you know what you are looking for. Since we're interested more generally in any updates regarding authorization of monoclonal antibody treatments, we'll scroll down to the first monoclonal antibody on this page with an update limiting its authorized use. Then we come to the information for citrovimab and see, at least on this slide, that it was last updated on April 5th. There is a section devoted here to current announcements on the left, so that's a great place to check for more updates. And then on the right, you can see the most up-to-date version of the fact sheets, and you can see the last updated date is there in parentheses. Several of the authorized therapeutics also have a frequently asked questions document that's posted, and the last updated date is included for those as well. And at the bottom right, you'll see a link to the CEDAR scientific review documents supporting EUA. So we'll click on that and show you what that brings you to. So clicking on that link, it takes you to the homepage for all available CEDAR scientific review documents supporting EUAs for therapeutics. And here we'll show an example of Citrova Mab's review documents. These review documents are very comprehensive and they contain valuable safety and efficacy information. And these review documents have been a great resource for us in answering complex questions. 
So switching to expand and access, expand and access is not new um, and it's not specific to the COVID-19 pandemic, but it is a pathway for, for providers who are seeking to treat patients with an immediately life-threatening condition or serious disease with an investigational medical product outside of a clinical trial when no comparable or satisfactory alternative therapy options are available. So this pathway has been a valuable resource during the pandemic for patients who do not meet the criteria for treatment under the emergency use authorization and do not qualify for a clinical trial. And staff at FDA are available 24 seven to receive emergency expanded access requests. So I think it's helpful to know about the expanded access program and where to find information about how to submit a request before you are faced with a qualifying patient in an emergency situation. So navigating to the expanded access page on the FDA website, we can see the introduction clearly defines the criteria for expanded access. And scrolling further down, you can see the page is organized into four main buckets. And we're showing further down on the page here on the right hand side. So you can see patients, physicians, industry, and forms. And we'll click on the information for physicians. On the physicians page, we see a list of frequently asked questions, including information on the different types of expanded access and how to submit requests. Scrolling down on the page leads to additional resources, which we are showing here on the right. This section contains valuable links to required forms, along with detailed instructions, also clinical trial information, and a link to the Reagan Udall Foundation's Expanded Access Navigator website. The EA Navigator is what we call it for short. It offers comprehensive user-friendly guides for physicians and healthcare providers, as well as for patients and caregivers. The EA Navigator is a helpful resource for providers who are seeking information about potential treatments and trying to locate sponsor information for a particular therapeutic. The EA Navigator also offers an online app called EA eRequest, which walks requesters through the submission process for non-emergency requests. Step-by-step -step instructions about how to apply for single patient expanded access are also available in video format for free on FDA's YouTube channel. This four-part video series provides short tutorials explaining the expanded access program and how physicians can submit a request for an individual patient. And FDA is also engaged on various social media platforms, and I'm going to share with you how you can connect with us and easily stay up to date. FDA is on Facebook and Instagram with the goal to connect with users through providing helpful, accurate, up-to-date information. We also try to correct misinformation and engender trust in the agency. So you can follow or like us and encourage your patients and colleagues to also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We are also on Twitter and we have engaged on Reddit. And to maximize our outreach efforts, last year we began sending direct messages to stakeholders on Twitter to share important center actions. And in 2021, in order to further target our stakeholders, we engaged pharmacists on Reddit to inform them of important clozapine and iPledge REMS modifications that would affect patients and workflows. We reviewed comments from pharmacists on Reddit and it further informed our communication efforts to resolve REMS issues. So we encourage you to follow at FDA underscore drug underscore info on Twitter for the latest drug information. And for more in-depth insights into CEDAR actions, you can follow the director of our center, Dr. Patrizia Cavazzoni, on her own Twitter account. At FDA CEDAR director is where you will learn more about why a specific action was taken. Uh, Dr. Cavazzoni also provides news from CEDAR when there is no other announcement made, such as last month, as we show here on the right, when Dr. Cavazzoni shared her thoughts following an advisory committee meeting convened to discuss a new drug application for the treatment of ALS. On LinkedIn, we have a group specifically for pharmacists who are interested in drug information called GADIS, or the Global Alliance of Drug Information Specialists. 
And the goal of this group is to create community among drug information pharmacists while providing up-to-date CEDAR information and news that can benefit pharmacists, such as awareness of our upcoming drug information webinars in this series, which offer free live CE credits. And now it's time to get your phones out. You can open the camera app, zoom in on each of these barcodes, click the notification that pops up, and that's it. You are now connected to FDA updates and our social media accounts. And we will be putting this back up on screen later, so you'll have plenty of time to connect with these resources in just a minute. And finally, there's three additional ways to stay informed in the way that you prefer. The first is through podcasts. Our team in CEDAR creates podcasts so you can get your news on the go. These include our Drug Safety Podcast, SBIA Chronicles Podcast, and Disco Podcast. Drug Safety Podcasts provide emerging safety information about drugs in conjunction with the release of new drug safety communications. So this allows you to choose how you want to stay up to date. You can read the drug safety communication or you can listen to these important announcements. And you may not have heard of these next two podcasts, so I wanna be sure to take a minute to let you know about them. The first is called CEDAR SBIA Chronicles. This podcast features content from FDA's CEDAR Small Business and Industry Assistance, and it's released in conjunction with the SBIA Chronicles newsletter. So this resource provides information to assist in all aspects of drug marketing and regulation. As with the Drug Safety Podcast, you have the choice. You can read or listen to the SBIA Chronicles, which makes it really convenient and easy to stay up to date with CEDAR's small business and industry assistance news. And the last podcast you might not know about is Disco. And yes, they have fun with the name and give you a little taste of disco music when you listen. And so Disco, uh, otherwise known as the Drug Information Soundcast in Clinical Oncology, is created in partnership with FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence. The DISCO podcast provides information about new cancer product approvals, emergency safety information for cancer treatments, and other current topics in cancer drug development. All FDA podcast episodes are available on our website, also through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and ReachMD. And as mentioned earlier, related to the expanded access video series, the Division of Drug Information also develops FDA Drug Info Rounds videos. This video series is specifically created for healthcare professionals and provides important drug information on pertinent health topics. Shown here is a video describing the medication guide distribution requirements for healthcare professionals. Based on your attendance here today, you already know about our free CE webinars for healthcare professionals. But if you haven't checked out our free home study CE webinars, be sure to visit our website to learn more. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and attention today. If you have any questions from today's presentation, please don't hesitate to reach out to our amazing team of pharmacists and drug information specialists in DDI. You can call or email us with questions. I encourage you to visit our website to learn even more about our division and programs. I, of course, encourage you to follow us on social media, sign up for email updates, and stay up to date in whatever way works best for you. The quick sign up QR codes will be on screen again for you later. Thank you. And now we can review just a few questions. We're at 159 now. Um, so, Lindsay, let me take a look. All right, let's do, can you use labels.fda.gov to find approved drug labeling? That's a great question. Yes, so we went through that example for an unapproved drug, um, and it depends on the context of the question. So I would suggest drugs at FDA as the database of choice. Um, if the inquirer is trying to find only reviewed and approved labeling for FDA, and, and this can be kind of a long answer, uh, but oftentimes that's not what the healthcare professional is looking for. What they're looking for is the most recently submitted labeling to FDA. Um, and labels.fda.gov is a great resource to find the most recently submitted labeling. Um, and if you go back through the slides, it was slide 17, um, I'm looking on the side here, uh, 
that shows you all the different ways to search. Um, and one of the most useful in my experience is one of the combination search choices where you can enter the proprietary name and the company name. And that allows you to really quickly pull up the labeling for a drug by a particular company. Um, for example, the labeling for a particular generic or from a specific repackager. Um, and this submitted labeling often also contains the images of the container packaging as well, uh, which sometimes can, can help answer the person's question. Thank you so much, Commander Wagner. And we are at 201, so let's take one more question from the audience. Are vaccine labels and regulatory documents included in Drugs at FDA database? So the answer to that question is no. The drugs at FDA is specific for approved human drug products um, that have been reviewed and approved by FDA, by the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And vaccine products are regulated by a different center, one of those nine product centers in the agency, the Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research, or CBER. All right. Thank you, Commander Wagner. Um, and unfortunately, we are out of time, 2.03. Um, so thanks for staying on a little bit uh, past two. If there were questions that we didn't have time to address today, please email them to our Division of Drug Information email address at druginfo at fda.hhs.gov for assistance. Um, and you can get your phones back out um, to scan the QR codes on your screen. Um, to stay connected to the Division of Drug Information. Um, it's to follow us on Twitter and also to su subscribe to our DDI listserv. Um, so get your cameras out and scan those. Um, this does conclude our activity for today. The FDA appreciates your participation in this webinar, and we hope that you will join us again in the future. If you need more CEs for your license renewals this year, please check out our list of home study CE webinars at www.fda.gov slash DDI webinars. We have about 17 listed um, on there for home study CE uh, courses, so please check them out. You may also find additional free CE credits such as FDA's drug regulation course titled FDA's role in public health, drug efficacy, safety, quality, and beyond on our Cedar Learn website by entering Cedar Learn in the search engine on fda.gov. Thank you all for attending and please stay safe and healthy this summer. Take care.